Hey, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Understanding CBD. I'm your host, Stephen Wallman from Wallman's Apothecary. For those that don't know, we make very high quality hemp CBD tinctures. Um, what sets us apart is our full cannabinoid terpene profile on the bottle. Um, QR code to the full lab report. We test every batch for heavy metals, pesticides, mycotoxins, mold, mildew, all that good stuff. Um, enough about me. We have a fantastic guest today. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Benjamin Kaplan. And our conversation is going to be around cannabis as an exit drug. And many people think of uh, cannabis or have heard of cannabis as an on-ramp or a gateway drug. Uh, but we have uh, some really good conversations with someone who's very experienced about using cannabis as medicine. So if you thought that uh, cannabis is uh, cannabis is medicine comes with a wink wink um, just to uh, get get stoned, then uh, you're going to learn a lot today. Um, let me introduce you to Dr. Benjamin Kaplan. Um, he's the founder and the chief medical officer of CED Clinic, CED Foundation and EO Care Inc., uh, as well as co-founder of Solo Sciences, acquired by, uh, I think I'm saying this right, a Kerna Corp. Um, uh, Dr. Kaplan is board-certified doctor of family medicine. After an early career in brain imaging research at UCLA, he graduated from Williams College, completed his medical degree at Tufts University School of Medicine, and a family medicine residency at Boston University. Um, in addition to a practice as a primary care physician at some of Boston's foremost hospitals, Dr. Kaplan served as the chief medical officer of one of the largest medical cannabis healthcare groups in the United States. See, seeing the clinic evaluations over 250,000 medical patients, okay? Um, Dr. Kaplan has supervised and mentored hundreds of physicians across the United States and abroad. He served as an investigator for multiple pharmaceutical research studies and has published in premier medical journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, champion, uh, Dr. Kaplan champions the value of an evidence-based approach to bridging Western medicine with the plant therapy ecosystem. Under his direction, the CED clinic embodies one of the largest living labs, a center of excellence learning the therapeutic benefits of medical cannabis and amassing a database of longitudinal, longitudinal actionable data and real outcomes for over 16,000 active medical patients. Uh, Dr. Kaplan has grown CED, CED Clinic with a unique perspective on cannabis-based therapies that incorporates the lessons of data science, crowdsourced experiential knowledge, and individual treatment strategies discovered graciously in collaboration with each of his patients. Through his work as co-founder or advisor of several cannabis startup companies and entrepreneurial boards, consulting for industry, industry leadership, speaking at academic and investor conferences internationally, and as an author pioneering the cultural paradigm shift, Dr. Kaplan has become an authority within the cannabis community and an enthusiastic catalyst for the industry. He's recently named as one of the 100 most influential individuals in cannabis. He also has a new book coming out, like it wasn't enough, um, <laughs> The Doctor Approved Cannabis Book, uh, which we hope uh, he'll get a chance to talk about us today. Dr. Kaplan, yeah. welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and, and, and if there's anybody left from that uh, snoozer of a bio, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're joining. Yeah, sorry if I left anything out on there, but you have a, I wanted to make sure I mentioned everything because it's impressive, Doc. I mean, you have committed yourself to cannabis and, um, and uh, you know, it's impressive because it's most often that I'm speaking with clients or patients or just people walk, when I'm walking the dog and they're telling me about their wife or their husband or their friend that's struggling with something. And I mentioned, well, have you, you know, have you considered using cannabis? And it's like, whoa, 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 you know, like, uh, either either they think it's, you know, cannabis is like a wink, wink, like it really isn't medicine. It's just people trying to get stoned and forget about their problems um, or they're they just don't have any confidence on. They think they have to smoke it. So, um, you know, you being um, uh, an actual real doctor, um, it, it brings a lot of credibility. So thanks. So while we're while you're while we're here, you had the book held up. Can you tell us a little bit about um, this new book? Because I, I don't even think it's released yet. Right. Right. Yeah. No, very few people um, 
know about it. Only a handful of people have have read it. Um, you know, interestingly, among the list is a announced um, endorser um, who nobody knows about yet. I haven't mentioned it anywhere um, publicly, um, and that's Melissa Etheridge. Um, you know, the 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 rock star goddess of of you know the last few decades, um, and she's she's really gone out and um, you know explored cannabis in her own right and, and has learned about it and has some really flattering things to say about it. So I'm, I'm immensely proud um, for the reception already among the few people that have read it. Um, but, you know, maybe if we have time, I, I can read a snippet today um, for the folks that happen to be watching. Um, but the book, you know, the book is, is, a, is, is a remarkable achievement for me. Uh, my dad is a doctor and has published um, tremendously. And I've always been in his shadow, you know, sort of timid to be able, you know, to put myself out there and, and share what I'm learning. But um, I felt like it was almost an obligation. You know, you, you talk about this cannabis industry um, as kind of fledgling and still kind of figuring it out. Um, and of course, you know, I, I completely agree. Um, and one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this book is share everything that, that I've been learning. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned in the, in the, in the long bio, um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm anything special is simply because I've learned from so many people. Um, you know, I, I took um, academia very seriously and I, and I took what my patients have learned very seriously, still, still of course do. Um, and I just recorded data from people sharing their learnings um, and connected all those dots into, into what is this telling us? You know, for everything from, you know, when people are consuming cannabis during the daytime, when are most people consuming? Um, and people, you know, generally have no idea, but um, the vast majority of people are consuming at the end of the day, um, you know, as, as a way to unwind from a stressful work day. Um, and, and that's just one thing I had to ask, hey, when do you typically consuming? And when you get a view of 300,000 people, you start to get a, a pattern of what human nature is with cannabis. I mean, it's just a, a magnitude of information. Um, and of course, that's just one small piece of it. There's a huge book's worth. Um, and it's 16 chapters. I cover all the major illnesses that, that people are using cannabis to, to help manage um, everything from from the, the things people commonly think about cannabis. So seizures, um, you know, massive headache stuff. Um, I guess people know about cancer and managing symptoms with cannabis. Um, but there's lots of other things that everyday people are using cannabis for, um, you know, including pain of, of all sorts, anxiety, stress, depression. Um, and actually top of the list is difficulty sleeping. Um, you know, we live in a world where there's so much hitting us, you know, in, in all different directions and people have trouble sleeping. Um, and very few people know um, how amazing cannabis is for the, for the folks who do try it and, and, and use cannabis under guidance. Um, you know, as you were sort of alluding to before, it's out there. Um, and, and, you know, thank heavens it is um, because people have access to it and can figure it out as they go. Um, but one of the other missions of this book is to sort of educate the medical community as well as the general public, um, because people who are exploring and finding success are knocking on the doors of their doctors and the ecosystem, the, the sort of industry, um, trying to explain to them this is working for, for them. And they're getting kind of turned away that doctors, you know, for years have been pushing people away from from drugs um, as a bad thing. And only only the pharmaceutical choices are the right choices, you know, and, and, and of course, that's bunkers. Um, but it's simply because we as doctors have not been educated. Um, so hopefully this book will take a take a stab at that. Um, trying yeah. to, trying so, to so, they, so uh, you know, I got a list of questions most likely won't get to them. But, um, well, you know, so as a patient, right, walking into a doctor's office, they do the intake form and it's, you know, do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you use any drugs? Um, you know, historically, it's been most of the guidance of, hey, you know, Tell you, unless you're sick or you're dealing with something else, you know, hold that stuff back from the doctor because they're going to note it down on their chart and then they're going to increase your insurance rates or something. I'm not really sure where the fear is, but um, what's your advice now with, you know, in, in a, you know, for, let's say, a, a young student, a college student you know, in their 20s, um, maybe just, you know, going in for a checkup. They have a medical card or they or they're using cannabis. You know, how do they how do they start that conversation with the doctor that isn't as open as you? Right, right. No, it's 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 a challenge. And I think, you know, to set the, the sort of record straight, 
doctors are not policemen. Um, and, you know, do by doctor, I just want to make clear, I'm also including physicians, assistants, nurse practitioners, folks who are sort of in, in the medical realm. Um, you know, we're not connected to law enforcement. There's no penalty of being honest. And I think, you know, there's an old adage that you don't lie to your lawyers and you don't lie to your doctors because, you know, we're supposed to be aligned with people trying to help them. Um, and, I, you know, I remember as a, as a kid filling out that form and, and, and certainly masking anything I, I might have tried. Um, but the truth is those questions are there to learn where people's needs are. Um, and sometimes, sometimes individuals who are going to a doctor are clear about their needs. You know, I need help. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling sad, whatever. Um, but some people actually aren't, aren't, aren't so in tune with those words and they might, they might be using cannabis. They think recreationally as we sort of a, a call it as a culture, but through a different lens, the doctors might see that as, Hey, maybe they need some support. Maybe they're feeling uncomfortable in their social circumstances, or maybe they're feeling stressed out and they're really self managing, self medicating to treat something, um, self caring. Um, and, and, and so being honest is a way to express that to the doctor for those folks who are, um, not so in, insightful about their own well-being. Mm -hmm. So feel comfortable telling your doctor, they're not going to call the cops on you if you're in a place where it's not legal and insurance, is that a, like if they, if you smoke, does that go on your chart and get reported to the insurance company? Cause I know that's been a concern. That's a good question. So one of the, one of the, one of the, um, one of the companies I've helped to build EO care um, is learning about what people are doing as far as it gets them off of other medicines. Um, and, and not a lot of people know this, but you know, I've learned from my patients that um, close to 70%, 73% of the patients I've seen either get off of a medicine or reduce the dosage over time. Um, so it's a powerful, um, it, it's a powerful exit drug in that sense, getting away from pharmaceuticals. Um, but that data has to be recorded. We have to learn that and demonstrate it to the insurance companies. Um, because right now there isn't good clinical trial data of what, what's worked for humans. Um, but if we have that in, a, in this living lab that EO kind of can manage, um, we have powerful evidence that the insurance companies require in order to cover the cannabis. Um, they're not going to go out on a limb um, to cover it and then we'll figure out if it works. They're going to see that it works first and then, you know, put their dollars in. Um, well, yeah, that's another good point because, um, you know, getting equal access to cannabis to so people who need it, um, it's not covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the longer we keep that in the shadows, the further away we are into including it into that offering to have it as a covered medicine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, in, cannabis is an interesting position because, you know, that that sort of line of questioning and this conversation is really in the mindset of a world which is a pharmaceutical world. Like, you know, we we want medicine. We get the medicine from the doctor at the pharmacy and then we take it. Um, but that's really a, a weird mindset that we've all been kind of indoctrinated with. You know, mm -hmm. we're accustomed to um, cannabis. You can grow. Um, and you know, it's, it's like a set of tomatoes. You're not going to think about the insurance co company covering your tomato juice, um, or your, or your tomatoes that you're slicing up. Um, you know, similarly, if you're growing your own medicine, um, you don't really need insurance for that, but what you do need is guidance. And, and most people out there don't know what they're doing. Um, don't know how to help themselves. Um, so my sort of role in the circus is to help people learn, um, about, the plant about kind of themselves matching with a certain plant. Um, and I'm, I, I, a way of understanding me is kind of the way that I do that is either directly in my clinic. That's the seed clinic that you mentioned, CED clinic. Um, another way is through um, digital means, you know, EO care um, manifests its learning from patients through an app and through a web-based platform where we can kind of guide people directly. So for folks who don't necessarily want to read the book or don't necessarily want to see a doctor, um, they have a choice which is still guiding them effectively. Um, and believe it or not, I'm getting into AI. Um, one of the things that I've done um, is build the world's largest library of cannabis publications. Um, it's just the, the nerdiest possible um, bath of, of publications. Um, it's, it's all free right now for the public, whoever wants to read it. But honestly, who, you know, who, who non-scientists or non-doctors reading academic journals? Very few people. Um, so I'm building... Um, and an AI librarian um, through a chatbot. So instead of like ChatGPT, um, which has some medical publications, but also some um, absolute junk that the general public has put into the internet too, um, ChatGPT absorbs all of that stuff. Um, but I've actually built this walled garden or I'm building this walled garden 
of cannabis publications plus my own education of that librarian so that people will be able to come and ask just basic questions and learn about the entire scientific literature. Um, so it's, it's no, a new, new So the, you know, the challenge with a lot of this literature, me, I'm not a doctor, I'm not trained in that. So I can look at a report. I try to parse through, I read it, you know, I don't comprehend, you know, it could be one word. I just don't even understand what the word is. So the, you know, it is important to have an expert translate this, you know, this information. So it's really cool that you're making that available to people and, and as a resource and applying AI technology to it is just uh, it's the obvious uh, way to go from here. Yeah. Um, so, so kind of flipping the that discussion over from patients and advice when they talk to their doctor. If you're um, if you're a you know, family doctor, nurse practitioner, or someone that's doing that onboarding or, or consulting with a patient and and you aren't familiar with it, with cannabis and it, it comes up, what's the right answer? You know, because I've heard all things from different doctors, you know, what would someone that, you know, if the doctor is listening or someone's listening right now and they don't know, they don't have the experience, they don't have the confidence, it's not in their you know arsenal of options. Um, what's the right response for them? It's interesting. I mean, you know, I think um, just as people should be honest with their doctors about kind of where they're coming from, the providers out there should be honest about where they're coming from. And, and the truth is they don't have medical training in, in, in the vast majority of cases. It's, it's pretty rare, actually, that anybody has medical training about cannabis therapies. And, and more than that, um, doctors are not just book smart. Um, and they, they have studied, but they've also learned from real people in real life. And sometimes the things that we study in books don't manifest in reality. And we learn a very different kind of truth from our patients and what's actually working at home. Um, so that clinical experience is a really important piece of the, the clinical puzzle. Um, and very few doctors out there um, have any clinical experience. You know, not only have they not learned about it, but they also have not seen patients over time. Um, so, so I think, a um, long way of saying, um, doctors should be honest with their patients. I think should direct them to knowledgeable referrals. You know, we have a referral system in modern medicine. You know, if a doctor is not a rheumatologist or not a dermatologist, if you have a complicated rheumatology or dermatology question, they're, they're pitching you over to the expert. Um, and my hope is that, you know, clinicians out there can be humble enough to recommend the experts. That's a fantastic recommendation. That way they're saying, hey, look, I'm not an expert, but there are experts out there. Let me suggest one or two. And I know a lot of them and they're happy to talk to patients and um, and take them on. Um, so that's 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 really a good uh, a good plan. So what the other thing is, obviously, as a doctor, um, you don't want to do any harm. So if you're not educated and you're typically thinking of cannabis as a drug that isn't um, nothing is harmless, right? It's, you know, the dose is the poison. It depends on how you use it. Um, what's your perspective on um, harms with cannabis? So, you know, a lot of people think, well, it's, it's a plant. It's, you know, I can grow in my garden like a tomato, right? Uh, nothing wrong with that. What, what do you have to say about that? Um, I think harm in this kind of context has to be sort of subdivided into what we mean by that. Um, you know, in terms of, of toxicity, meaning the amount of the stuff which would be harmful, um, it's probably a, an amount which is larger than any human could eat. Um, I mean, in theory, it's potentially toxic. Um, There's a judge actually in, in a federal court case in the 80s um, who said it was probably more likely for someone to die from a bale of cannabis hitting them on the head than from anything they could consume. Um, and I think, you know, the punchline is um, consuming cannabis is is really only harmful as we know it if someone has an allergy to cannabis. And in Massachusetts, you know, not too long ago, a couple months ago, someone who had an allergy to um, one of the components of cannabis, you know, unfortunately passed away because of the exposure. Um, so, you know, the idea that cannabis is harmless is 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 a little bit over overplayed. Um, but for the vast majority of people, um, cannabis is acting like any vegetable would. Um, and vegetables are not all harmless. You know, for some people, um, your liver is digesting the cannabis um, to process as it does for everything else that we consume. Um, but if your liver is busy, then it might not be processing, you know, potentially medicines you're taking. 
Um, and that means those medicines might be a little bit stronger than without the cannabis. Um, so there's an interaction there um, that might be, you know, potentially more complicated than most people would want to deal with. And that's the job of a doctor. Um, so I think that's, you know, one of those cases where if you're consuming cannabis and other medicines, it's wise to have someone who knows about those things to, to look out for you. Um, but, you know, back to the sort of categories, I think of harm, there are physical effects of cannabis, um, you know, dry mouth, bloodshot eyes are the obvious ones, but also increasing heart rates. Um, for some people who have sensitive hearts or have heart issues that can pose trouble. Um, you know, for some people, cannabis makes them dizzy or lightheaded. Um, and that can also pose issues if, if you also have um, wobbly legs for one reason or another. Um, psychological effects is, is, is very clear. You know, people who use cannabis are altered. Um, your thinking process is a little bit different. Um, and for many people, they want that and that's an advantage. Um, but for some people that's off-putting, it's off-settling, um, especially for people who have a predisposition for some mental health challenges that can be catastrophic. Um, you know, just like if you're walking down the street um, and a bus kind of swoops right close to you, that might terrify you. Um, you know, that's a that's an experience which which is both physical, you know, and makes your heart race, but also psychological. You were almost killed. You know, some people have dramatic responses to that. Um, that kind of experience can happen chemically, too, um, even if the, the sort of chemistry itself is not toxic. The experience can be off putting. Um, and, and then, you know, apart from that, there are people who become um, dependent on cannabis, um, which is different than um, addicted. Um, there are some people who are prone to addiction. I think with anything, there are people who are addicted to coffee. There are people who are addicted to exercise. Um, there are also people who are addicted to cannabis. Um, and what that means is, is some, some, something bad has come from someone's continued use of cannabis. Maybe they're, um, you know, not crying on the shoulders of friends or they're not, you know, fulfilling their job applications or, you know, they're self-isolating or they're stealing money so that they can afford buying it. You know, there's all kinds of things that um, pose potential harm for addiction of cannabis. Um, but dependency is different um, and, and people do become dependent on cannabis um, and that's sort of a potential harm. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that's the, um, the thought of today's talk, which is around uh, cannabis as an exit drug. So when um, a doctor would recognize that the use of a certain prescribed medicine or drug is becoming a problem, whether it's lab reports are showing, Hey, there's, there's issues with some side effects here. Um, or if it's a behavioral problem, when when that's noticed, you know, how do you see? Um, you know, let's just take an example. So, a pain patient with opioids, you know, how would cannabis be? Uh, what's the expectation for using cannabis as an exit drug in that case? It's a great example. Um, out of um, out of the people that I see who are guided with cannabis and prescribed opiates for, you know, bone break or, or something um, or, or cancer treatment, um, over 90% of them um, don't use the, the full prescription that they're given. Um, in many cases, they only use a few days of the opiates because the cannabis is giving them enough relief and, and they don't need to, um, to risk the side effects of opiates. Um, you know, we all, we all, know the dangers of opiates for, for kind of different reasons. Um, the most scary stuff is, you know, people are, are becoming addicted to them and, and dying from, from opiate uh, overdoses. Um, but that's, you know, not your, your average Jane and Joe. Um, you know, most people who are taking opiates are prescribed to them um, and they have awful side effects. You know, opiates can be, you know, not only um, a roller coaster, because when you take the opiate, of course, you're feeling better. But then when you are not taking it or when the, the amount of opiate in your system goes down, you feel terrible, kind of worse than when you were, you know, at baseline. Um, but also opiates are very constipating. And for people that can be a miserable um, experience. If you're already experiencing illness or, you know, a bone break and terrible pain, you know, on top of that, not being able to poop is, is, is excruciating um, and, and sort of demeaning and, you know, people feel awful. Um, so there's a whole there's a whole spectrum of adverse effects related to opiates um, that actually don't come with cannabis. Um, so to sort of contrast the two, um, they both, believe it or not, um, hit the mu opiate receptors in your brain. Um, those are the receptors um, which help you feel calm and comfortable while you're taking um, opiates. And cannabis does touch those same receptors, the exact same receptors, um, not with the same uh, intensity, not with the same duration, but nonetheless, 
you know, there, there's similar um, appeal, similar relief. Um, but then cannabis also has a ton of other effects that are probably more than the time we have today to talk about. But suffice it to say that people feel both comfortable, they feel a little bit of the opiate goodness, um, but none of the adverse effects. Um, and, and in some ways, um, you know, it's the proof is in the pudding that, you know, the, so many people are just preferring cannabis to the opiates. Um, and then I, mean, you- I realize that the um, that mechanism of action is similar between the two enough to help get a I mean, that's a pretty high rate of um, success of helping people wean off and, and really reduce the dependency on opioids. Now, since we're talking about pain, um, I'm a golfer. It's very often, you know, as we get older, most people have pain and they're not going to go to the doctor to get it prescribed. They're going to go over the counter and they're going to grab uh, Tylenol or ibuprofen and just get into a habit of, you know, hey, before my round, every couple, you know, I'm going to just throw a couple of these in my mouth and uh, use that as an anti-inflammatory. Um, I personally have seen some side effects and issues with that, which is how I got into this whole uh, cannabis space. Um, what, what do you think about or what can you advise people that are just harmlessly over the counter taking in their mind Tylenol and popping those uh, Advil? I mean, is that safer than an opiate? Is there, is there side effects to that? And how does that compare to cannabis? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the sort of easy answer is, is they're much safer than opiates. That's why they're, they're not prescribed. And that's why they're available over the counter um, in, in recommended doses. Um, so the, the nuance there is that people sometimes take more than they, they are meant to be taking simply because they're not paying attention to the labels. Um, and, and once people are, are kind of dosing themselves, once they're taking their own medical care into their own hands, um, there is potential risk. Um, you know, people who take uh, Motrin's, ibuprofens, um, sometimes have effects on the stomach, um, on the kidneys um, that they don't realize are relevant until kind of, you know, their doctor's telling them, whoops, something's not quite what they thought. Um, Tylenol, you know, also has effects, but but the, the, the sort of drama is overplayed um, for both of those. Um, the, the rates of people who find it helpful are vastly larger than the rates of folks who have issues. Um, and I think sometimes in our media, we, we see, oh my God, it's so terrible. And these, you know, these 20 people got, you know, t- had terrible issues, but we're not paying attention to the 10,000 of people who didn't. Um, you know, we kind of, we overestimate the bias of, of, um, of the media. Um, so in large part, most of those medicines are safe, you know, in, in, even when they're being kind of taken too much. Um, it's really too much and for too long. Um, it's really like a, commi- a really strong commitment over time that those things become harmful. Um, but even so, um, if we contrast them with cannabis, um, the vast majority of people that I see um, who, over time who have taken cannabis and, and previously took ibuprofen or Tylenols kind of too much prefer the cannabis anyway. You know, it, it's very common for people um, to tell me you know, this cannabis was my Hail Mary at the end. I've tried prescriptions. I've tried over-the-counter stuff. I tried alternative medicine. And finally, you know, what the heck, I'll try this thing about cannabis that everybody's talking about. And and almost everybody's like, why didn't I do this first? You know, why didn't I try this? Why is this so demonized? It's not a big deal. Um, you know, there's a there's a level of of stigma, a, a, a thick baloney, and, and a layer of, of just misinformation that we all grew up with. Um, that stops people from exploring cannabis. And it's so foolish. And it's just, it's so harmful, just that stigma. Um, yeah, well, you're doing what you're doing is making a big dent in that. And we need more, you know, more people like you to help change that from an end of life or a last resort medicine to something that gets brought up before we go into these other options. Um, so um, routes of administration, right? I mean, your doctor never tells you to smoke anything you don't smoke any medicine, right? And most people are thinking, well, the thing I know about weed is I got to smoke it. So, you know, what, what is a recommended way to get started using cannabis for those um, people that, um, well, actually for anyone, you know, yeah. medically, how, how do you get started? You know, do you have to take bong hits? Do you, you know, have to roll a joint? What, what's the, the way to get started? If, if, you're, if your doctor or nutritionist hands you a bowl of spinach and says, go smoke it, I would look twice um, at seeing that person again. Um, yeah, I don't recommend smoking. I don't think um, it makes any sense scientifically. Um, I, do, I do understand that that's available and our culture has been smoking cannabis for 12,000 years. We got archeological evidence you know, back to the Egyptians um, and, and well before that actually, um, that 
humans have been intertwined with cannabis smoke forever. Um, but we are not that archaic people anymore. You know, we have tons of different ways of consuming cannabis. Um, you know, and a quick, a quick nerdy science lesson for people. Um, when you put flame to cannabis, the temperature of flame is more than 10 times the temperature you need to get the stuff in cannabis into your body. Um, you are literally taking that sweet marshmallow and throwing it in the middle of the bonfire instead of roasting it nicely outside. Um, it's just bonkers. Um, not only are you destroying the stuff you paid for, but you're mutating, you're changing the ingredients in that plant, which you know you want into stuff that you don't need that isn't really good for your body. Um, so it's not only silly and, and wasteful, but it's, it's potentially harmful. And um, we do see some of the mutations that happen when people smoke cannabis that can be harmful. Um, so what do you do instead? There's almost anything you can think of, um, you know, from edibles and candy to drops. Um, these days there are patches like a nicotine patch um, that last eight to 10 hours. Um, you know, the old uh, Listerine and Bananca sprays, the spritz to the back of the mouth, those are back and medicated. Um, there are eye drops in some, in some states. There are um, like Listerine strips that you put under your tongue, almost everything. Um, so for some people, um, it's actually so many options that they're overwhelmed. Um, and that's one of the jobs of the clinicians, the cannabis knowledgeable people to guide folks um, to help you understand what might be right for you. Um, you know, and, and, and some clinicians do that one-on-one -on -one as, as I do. Um, and that's, you know, if we look to EO, this company, this digital company that I built, um, I'm trying to scale that so that everybody can profile who they are, what they're looking for, and you get a personalized kind of routine for you. Um, so I think technology is coming in and the old fashioned way is there and whatever someone's comfortable with, um, you have your choices. Yeah. So you heard it here, not that you can't smoke it, but smoking it mutates the natural plant compounds and you're actually getting less than you could be by consuming it in a, a more, um, you know, reasonable way. Now, you know, I, I'm part of the, you know, growing and, and harvesting and production of cannabis. So I know the, um, as soon as you cut the plant down, the compounds start to go away. So light, uh, temperature, time is all part of this equation when we're talking about plant medicine. So, you know, getting that whole plant is possible, which is actually one of the, my, leading me to another question here. Um, whole plant versus, um, I guess, isolate mixed, you know, do you have any experience on um, which one would be first to look at? I mean, should you look at um, a lot of uh, products out there or like we are in our lab and we have a list of, you know, isolated cannabinoids and we're going to put a little bit of THC. We're going to make a ratio of THC to CBD um, versus someone who's going to look for a certain variety that naturally grew these compounds together. Do you have any, you know, advice or perspective on that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, we are not all the same um, and cannabis is not all the same. And um, matching the two is the real moneymaker. Um, so for, that's, that's um, no, no. Um, so depending on what your genes have built you or what your environment has changed for you, um, you might match with a different type of cannabis. Um, and we don't yet have a system to understand well what your constitution is. There are some companies that claim that they do. There's now genetic testing for cannabis. Um, there's also, you know, testing that you can look at, at, at from a store based on, you know, what's in the product you buy. Um, but matching those two is tough because even in, in you, it changes over time, you know, depending on how much you slept, how much you exercised, what foods you had. Um, so this is an evolving um dance. Um, so knowing what product is best for you is a very hard thing for anybody to, to figure out. And that's another one of these reasons I'm kind of trying to leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and modeling that in, in sort of, you know, with computer tools. Um, in terms of isolates versus full plants, uh, what we do see is your receptors get bored of seeing the same thing. Um, you know, just like if you're in the shower and you're enjoying warmth, sometimes you have to crank up the heat a little bit to 
feel it. Um, your body is programmed to, to feel something and get used to it and then start ignoring it. Um, so having a mixture, um, uh, that's where the, the shower sort of metaphor dies, but having some cannabinoids that are not all the same um, is, is, is pleasing to your receptors. You, you sort of get more sense out of them. You get more bang for your buck. Um, so in general, the recommendation is, is almost always, it's better to have multiple choices in what you're taking, multiple ingredients rather than just one, um, which, is, which is actually counterintuitive to some people. They think, well, we don't know about all this. I want to try just one thing at a time. Um, and for some people that will work fine, but your, your, your body's going to get used to that and become tolerant of it much more quickly than if you had a, a multi-buried thing. Yeah, well, that's a good takeaway, which is it's, it's not a set it and forget it. Um, there's, there isn't a, um, you know, one of the questions I'm sure you get when you have a diagnosis for a patient and you suggest a treatment, am I going to have to do this forever? You know, am I going to have to be on this forever? You know, um, do you ever get that question? <laughs> I got it yesterday. It's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we, we live in this mindset, you know, I think partly because of the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and the, and the, the sales, the money that they derive from us being, uh, lemmings, um, that, you know, once you're on a medicine, you got to be on it for life. Um, and I don't have that mindset with cannabis as I was just sort of alluding, we change over time. Um, and one of the cool things about cannabis is not so much that it's effective while you're taking it, but as you're taking it, you sort of have a new mindset, a new outlook on your circumstances and you can learn. And that's really what the, the sort of body of therapy is psychotherapy. Uh, when you talk to a therapist, it's not just the wonderful conversation that makes you feel better you're learning a skill set of how to think differently about your situations or about your past. Um, and the same is true of, of taking cannabis. You, you sort of become, um, in general, a more comfortable person, hopefully. Um, and in that experience, as you're feeling relaxed, as you're feeling less pain, less anxiety, or you're sleeping better, you, know, you can start working on some, some longer lasting tools and then not need the cannabis over, over the long haul. Yeah. So, and, and so it's not a set it and forget it, you know, it's not like, well, now you're on cannabis. This is the variety. This is what you're taking and this is it forever. Uh, you want to, you know, it seems like be in tune to the changes that your body's going through. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things that, that I, I made front and center with, with the book is, is what is cannabis useful for now? What might you want to plan for later? Um, how does the process work, you know, from what to pick, to, you know, potentially how to learn how to grow, who to talk to, how to manage it, sort of everything um, I packed into this, this book, um, which for the audience um, that is still listening and still interested um, will be available um, October 17th, but it's, it's available for pre-order today. Um, and anybody who's interested um, can wander over to kaplancannabis.com. It's Kaplan with a C and cannabis with a C, um, kaplancannabis.com. Um, and you can pre-order it. You can learn more about me. You can see some of the things I'm doing if, if you're interested. Do you have any, um, we're coming to the end here, but do you have any uh, time to read a little bit out of the book? I mean, we didn't talk much about, um, I guess, the endocannabinoid system specifically. Um, was there something that you'd like to share that uh, sure. jumps out? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I can read about the endocannabinoid system in action. Um, oh, yeah, tell me about that. Sure. And this is this is a section of the book that nobody has heard of um, or read. Um, so those who are listening and interested will, will be the sneak preview audience. All right, um, the cannabinoid, endocannabinoid system in action. This is actually just from chapter one. Um, cannabis can uniquely influence both the brain and body, which makes it an ideal therapy for so many areas of health. The reason it has the ability to communicate with just about every cell in the body via the endocannabinoid system. Endo refers to molecules that are produced inside the body Cannabinoid refers to the collection of molecules and or their precursors, either naturally occurring in the body or produced from plants and their receptors in the body. This receptor molecule combination activates a massive array of positive health effects. Cannabis products are literally copycats of the endocannabinoids. They're almost identical to the form and function of the naturally occurring molecules that are found in almost all living creatures. The endocannabinoid molecules we naturally produced are called anandamide and 2-arachnoidal glycerol, 2-AG and AEA. AEA is found in nearly all animal tissues and some plant tissues. 2-AG is found at high levels in the nervous system and is derived from the same essential pathways as AEA. There are also 
cannabinoid molecules that are produced outside the body, specifically from plants, which are called phytocannabinoids. All plant-derived cannabis products, whether they are THC-based or CBD-based, are considered phytocannabinoids. As endocannabinoids are so prevalently, prevalently produced uh, throughout the body, scientists believe that the purpose of the system is to maintain overall balance or homeostasis and keep our internal functions running smoothly. We know that the system impacts mood, memory, appetite, immune function, and nervous system signaling functions. What's more, the endocannabinoid system is a dynamic evolving system that adapts to the immediate environment. The body produces and stores endocannabinoid molecules as needed. And these molecules find their way to endocannabinoid receptors in a steady circadian rhythm, much like the rhythms of sleep, hormone cycles, fitness, and nutrition. This is all the stuff we were talking about just here today. Um, so that's a, a sneak preview. As you can see, I've tried to write it so that it's simple. There's not fancy scientific language. Everybody deserves to understand what's going on, what the what the reality is. Um, and I make I make no claims in this entire book, which are not backed with a reference in the book. Um, there's over uh, 350 pages in the 16 chapters and over 120 references. Um, so every every stake in the ground that I make. Um, has a reference that everybody can look up and, and research. Um, and interestingly, the book has, has, has no pictures, um, but I put all of the pictures, or I will put, on my website, um, kaplancannabis.com, so that people can map along in real beautiful color images what they're reading in the book. Um, so I'm trying to make it a little bit more interactive. And of course, anybody that has questions as time goes on, time goes on can reach out to me. Um, I'm hoping I'll be around for a lot longer. And as the book comes out and people have questions, I want this to be an interactive sort of opportunity that, that folks who have serious illnesses, folks that have serious questions can always have access to the author. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks for reading that and sharing the exclusive sneak peek here of, uh, of your new book. And I just want to say thank you, Dr. Kaplan. I think now is you've done a lot of work to get to this point. And I still think this is just the beginning. And um, I look forward to more works of yours and getting this book out there and informing and educating more doctors that can really follow your lead because it's that leadership that we lack in so many of these different areas. And in order to make a change with how we see cannabis and break these stigmas, you know, people like you are extremely important. So thank you again for um, coming on the show, you know, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll support you in every way we can. And good luck to you with the release. I know I got mine ordered. So if you haven't got one ordered yet, you can get it right from Amazon and um, get your pre-order in. And um, anything else you wanted to mention to the audience before we uh, tune off today? No, no, it's all. I mean, I think the pre-order stuff is really important. That it's it's not just about me, actually. If, if imagine if this gets on the New York bestseller list, um, you know, I, I don't care about it for me. It's about the cannabis industry. This is a book of benefits that's evidence based. The sort of message that that sends the world that you know. 92 and 94 percent of of the Gallup poll respondents think cannabis should be around and legal and not sort of this mess that it is in our culture. Um, and my hope is that this book can be a sort of torch um, that way. Yeah, this is the first book that Random House has published that is cannabis related, right? Yeah, it's uh, Ben Bell is the publisher. Random House is the distributor. But yes. Yeah. So you are already breaking grounds here. So uh, let's keep this light going. And thanks again, Dr. Kaplan, for your time and appreciate everyone that uh, listen in. We had a lot of comments here along the way, um, a lot of people cheering you on and um, just saying that this is just really good information and appreciative. So thanks again, Doc. And um, we'll hopefully be talking again soon. Good luck with uh, with the book launch. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope um, the audience can reach out. I'm, I'm always around and happy to engage. That's amazing. Thanks. Yeah. You're on Twitter. You're on LinkedIn. Um, very accessible. And I think that's awesome. So thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great time.